Thanks for checking out a sermon from First United Methodist Church located in Sheridan, Wyoming. To learn more about who we are, please check out our webpage at fumcsheridanwy.org. Our scripture reading is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The word of the Bible for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? God, I ask that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing and glorifying to you. Amen. All right, throughout the next couple of weeks, we are in the uh, season of continuing to celebrate the resurrection, the season of Easter. This is very similar to the season of, uh, oh, now I just lost it. What's the season after Christmas? Epiphany, thank you, yeah. (laughs) I had an epiphany. it's very, very similar to the season of Epiphany, where, where we begin to ask ourselves the question and wrestle with, what does the resurrection mean, and how does it affect us? Uh, this morning, we turn to the uh, epistle of 1 John that gives us some insight into these questions. However... Before we jump completely into 1 John, I think it's important for us to understand a little bit about what is happening here before we go all in. So let me give you a little bit of background about 1 John. The style of writing of 1 John is close to the author of the Gospel of John. So for much of church history it was accepted that John wrote this letter. However, you knew that was coming, didn't you? More recently, some scholars have questioned the authorship. For our purposes, I'm just going to refer to it as John writing it. Okay? It's just easier. First John, John. All right, very good. This epistle is written like a sermon, uh, and it resembles the form of what is known as a letter essay. And so John, in his writing, is addressing specific situations that the readers are going through and trying to persuade the reader to respond in a certain way. So if John is writing a letter, a sermon letter, to a group of individuals. It would help, I think, to understand those individuals that are receiving it. So the setting of 1 John is writing, uh, he, he is writing to encourage Christians who are expelled from the synagogues, some of whose colleagues have returned to the synagogue by denying Jesus' messiahship. John is also addressing in this sermon letter 
the false teachers that are paving the way for what later will be known as Gnosticism. I'm not going into that this morning. You're welcome. This letter then is to speak against and clarify what the life of a follower of the way, which is what early Christians were called, can look like. Now, when we read these verses here in the Revised Common Lectionary, they very nicely stopped before the verses get super uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm grateful for that. However, what I will say is uh, they leave out verses 8 through 10, which go are, are, are connected to uh, the verses that we read this morning. I would encourage you to read them. The rest of the verses in this section begin to talk about the contrast of being called a child of God or a child of the devil. This contrast... Uh, is noted by a distinction in one's life as to who one abides with. So in order for us to to understand a little bit more about these verses, I I want us to to first define or or understand a a couple buzzwords that you'll notice throughout these verses. Uh, The first one is sin. Uh, that, that word, typically, when we hear it, does it, does it make us squirm a little bit? Maybe uh, churches over the, the centuries have, uh, have used that word as a shaming tactic. Uh, but what we want to be reminded about this word is it is an archery term, right? It's missing the mark. Uh, it's... It's a, uh, in the Greek, a departure from either human or divine standards of uprightness. Now, typically, writers, when they use this word, will make it a point to define it for themselves as well. And so, John, in, in writing this sermon letter, does help us understand his understanding of the word sin. And so if you do decide to look at verses 8, 9, and 10, I'm going to read verse 10 for you because I think it helps us understand where he's coming from when he's talking about this word. So this is verse 10, chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 10. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not know what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. Notice the language there. So what is he referring to? What is John referring to when he is talking about sin? He's talking about the lack or failure to love one another. So I think it's important to keep that in mind as we look at what Uh, is being talked about here. All right, the next word, abide. What does it mean to abide? Okay, to live in. Oh, I love this. There's so many, I can't follow it. Follow. Okay, to be somewhere. There was another one out there. Decide. Oh, B-side, B-side. Learn from. So if you would look up the word abide in the concise Oxford English Dictionary, this is what you would find. Accept or act in accordance with a rule or decision. Okay. In the Greek, the understanding that we get from this word that gets translated abide is to continue to exist. Remain last, persist, continue to live are all different ways in which we can translate this. So it gives us this understanding that we exist or remain with God. Now, in order for us to to understand that that word and and image there, John gives us a, a, 
what that can look like for this existence with God. And he calls us children of God, right? Uh, And so he connects us with this uh, parent to child relationship connection. All right. I also feel that it's important when we're talking about love that we also just discuss this word love. I think love is always a a challenging word to understand and, and talk about in our culture because we use it to describe so many different things. What do you love? Oh, your children, your husband, grandchildren, parents. You love to eat. Hot dogs, is that what you said? (laughs) Oh, your dogs. (laughs) Sorry, Uh, I was surprised coming from you. (laughs) Pronunciation is the key. Yeah, in, in, one, in one sentence, we can say we love coffee, and in the next sentence, we can say we love our spouse. We have a very interesting under, uh, way in which we use love in our culture. And so uh, it's always good, I think, for us to pause and, and think through what is being talked about here. And, and then, uh, like most, most places in Scripture, uh, the love that is used here is the agape love, which uh, I'm, you might have heard uh, that word before. Uh, this type of love is the love that describes compassion, uh, caring, grace, uh, the uh, care towards others. Okay. Now that we have uh, some clarity around where John or who John is writing this sermon to, and and some understanding or shared definition of of these words, uh, sin, abide, and love. Let's jump into these verses uh, and and understand what John is trying to get us to wrestle with today. Now, these these verses begin with the acknowledgement of God's love for us. Uh, That God's love in Jesus, the Son of God, has made us God's children too that we are sons and daughters of God. But then he starts talking about not being known. Well, why does the world not know us? This is, I think, pretty intriguing language that he's using here. And then when we stop to think, when we look at what is going around in our world right now, we can begin to understand. Wars. People are fleeing their countries because it's unsafe to live there anymore, while others continue to pursue power and prestige at the cost of other people. This this is the world in which we live in. So then the world shouldn't know us because we need to have a different set of values than the selfish gains that we notice around us because we are called to love, which means we are called to express Okay, love, compassion, kindness, and care for others. Why? Because that is what God has expressed to us. As a child of God, our endowment is God's prevenient love, which means that it is love for us without having to earn it, which I think, again, in our culture is difficult and challenging to understand because so much of our culture focuses on conditional. You have to work hard to earn it. Where here, God's love has already been uh, given. God's love has already been given 
we receive it without doing any work. And it's from that sense of love that we are invited into the work of God. The love that is expressed doesn't have strings attached to it. And I don't know about you, but that is difficult to understand. Because for some relationships, the love that is expressed has strings attached to it. Where here, God's love has expectations, but not strings. So this then is the reality. There is nothing that we have done or can do to earn the status of being called a child of God. It's not an entitlement. It is a reality of faith, which then calls us and invites us into a new way of living. Living out our faith is not a system of merits and rewards, but relying on the confidence that God loves us with an unearned love, which empowers us to do the same with those around us. Living by God's compassion and care for the world, a world that desperately needs it. We are God's children now. Though we don't know exactly what that looks like, John reminds us, but we know that when we abide in him, we will strive to live with God's purpose in our heart. And when we mess up, he goes on this, uh, John goes on this weird thing of you won't sin, right? Uh, If you're abiding in God, uh, but you slip. Yeah, you slip. Uh, I, I, there was, I was trying to figure out a, a nicer way of saying it than what was going on in my head, but uh, yeah, but you will, you will slip. And, and when, we, when we mess up and we, we turn back to our uh, divine parents' arms to, to try again, and I've always appreciated this, uh, this image of uh, God as parent and us as children, because there are times in our lives where where we're, we're encouraged not to touch something because it's hot. You know, don't touch that because it's hot. Uh, and, and, and what's our inclination? Wait, what, what are we not supposed to touch? Oh, that is hot. And, and the picture that I get of, of God is not, I told you not to touch it. So the burn on your hand, you, 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 you've earned it. You deserve it. Now, maybe next time you'll listen to me. That's not, that's not the parent that I see. The parent that I see is, that must have hurt. Come here. Let me hold you while you cry. Let's put, let's put some cream on that hand. Maybe you can learn a lesson in this and not do it again, even though you have a second hand. That prevenient love for us, that we can lean in and and understand the fact that God will help pick us up, dust us off, give us a hug, and send us right back out. Because we know, we know that now is the time that we are called and invited to live as children of God and not become complacent to the world around us, but to live lives of humility, compassion, and care which we understand as 
love for one another. My, my hope for us is that we will continue each and every day to look for ways that we can love one another, love our community as well by abiding in God's love for us as children of the Most High. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for for being our parent. For encouraging us, supporting us, helping us. Fill us, God, with your love so that it may overflow from our lives and into those around us. Help us, God, to remain in you as you remain in us. God, we love you, and we thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this week's sermon. We would love for you to join us again for worship in person or online, and we look forward to being with you next time.